Good morning, good afternoon, good evening guys, gals and gentle buds and welcome back to the shed. We're back in the shed again. Today I'm going to be reassembling the differential. So without further ado, I'll move the camera, we'll get set up and I'll show you and explain as we go. Right, so here we have the differential housing. So I've already pressed the new outer race of the inner bearing into place and the outer race of the outer bearing and assembled the inner race and the seal in that end. So the, the inner race of the inner bearing is pressed onto this shaft. They're quite tight. It took 15 tonnes of pressure on the hydraulic press to press the old bearing off the shaft. Refitting the new bearing is much simpler because what you do is put the shaft in the freezer, give it a good 24 hours, I got it down to minus 22 degrees, and warm the bearing up with a hot air gun, so I got it up to about 80 degrees, something like that, and then quickly take the shaft out of the freezer, stand it upright, drop the bearing on, and it should drop straight on, all the way down. Make sure you've got that spacer washer in place. I have forgotten one thing there, but I've put that together. But I'll pop that back out. The collapsible spacer. This is what allows you to set the preload. There's two methods of doing it. In this instance, it's done with a collapsible spacer. This is a brand new one, despite it looking a bit scruffy. So the outer bearing sits on there. Then the flange, the nut, tightens it up and the bearing in between the flange and that spacer. As you tighten it up, that spacer will crush, allowing the gap between the bearings to decrease, and therefore the load on the bearings, the preload on the bearings will increase. The preload setting is measured in pounds inch, so it's a torque setting. The, there is a torque specified for the flange nut, it's around 140 foot-pounds. The preload on the bearings is far more important than the torque on the nut. If I pop that back in through there, and then we can drop the flange on. Now, when you strip one of these down, it's a good idea to put a mark on the end of the shaft and one on the flange so that you get the alignment correct when they go back together. In theory, it should go on in any position, but in this case, these two have been together for 55 years. It would be a shame for them to go back in a different position and cause a problem. So all I've done is put a little centre mark, centre pin mark there, and another one there. So all I do is line those two centre pot marks up, slot that onto there, We'll leave the washer off, just pop the nut on, tighten the nut down to pull the shaft into the flange. Now there is a special tool to hold the flange while you tighten the nut up, but I haven't got one. So I've made one. So this is a simple piece of angle iron with a notch cut out of it to clear the flange so I can get the socket in. A couple of bolts at the relevant spacing to match two holes. So that goes on like so. Then I can clamp that to the end of the bench and then I can put the socket in and tighten that up. And the trick is to tighten it a little bit and just check. Yeah, we've still got play there, so it's got to go a bit further yet. It's starting to tighten up, so I think that's probably taken up all of the play. Very, very slight movement there now. So what I'm going to do now is just back off that nut and put the split washer on. Now the thing with setting preload with a collapsible spacer is you actually only get one shot at it because if you overshoot if you go too far if you get too much preload 
the collapsible washer, collapsible spacer, has collapsed too far and there's no way back from that. So you then have to strip it down, get another new collapsible spacer and start again. So it's always best when doing these to tighten it up in stages. Just a little bit at a time, checking at each interval what the preload is. First thing, we just need to remove that end float. Right, the end float has now gone. So I'm just going to move it over to the vise and I'll show you how to measure the preload. You can either do it with a torque wrench, but pounds inch torque wrenches are quite few and far between and it's difficult to get an accurate reading because it needs to be a moving reading not a static reading. The initial force to start that turning will be greater than the force needed to keep it turning. So the way I do it I've measured that width of the flange and it happens to be two inches so that means it's a one inch radius so if I attach a piece of wire, tie it off to one of the holes, and then wrap it round that portion of the flange. When I pull this, if I measure the force required to, to, to pull, to turn it, that is the force in pounds at one inch radius from the shaft center, i.e. pounds inch, inch pounds, whichever way you want to talk about it. Right, so with my scale zeroed, if I now pull that steadily, I'm getting 6.8 pounds. So we're a little bit short yet of the required torque. So we'll tighten the nut up a little bit and then do another reading. Right, so given the nut a quarter of a turn, zero the scale. And we're now on 7.5, so still a little bit further. What we're looking for is 13 pounds inch. So I wind that back, zero the scale, hasn't moved very much. It's a bit of a faff, but you've got to get that preload right. If you have too much preload, the bearings will be too tight, they will wear prematurely. And you really don't want to be doing this job to more than once. Right, zero the counter. Yep, I'm getting 13, 13 inch pounds, pounds inch whichever way you want to say it. Now the next step will be to set the meshing distance for the differential assembly. This is the limited slip differential unit. So it's a torque sensing or self auto torque biasing. The variety of names for them, they all work on the same principle. So that drops in there. Important point worth mentioning. These bearings are axial thrust bearings. They go on one way. And in this case, it's with the shield outwards. You can't see the inner face of those bearings because it's too narrow a gap. But the inner face doesn't have that shield and that thickness there is a lot smaller. So 
they have to go on the right way. Now, one of the jobs we need to do here is to shim these bearings. In the original setup, the shims go between the bearings and the diff carrier. Difficult to do anything with them because it, it's almost impossible to get these bearings off the diff carrier without destroying them, they fall apart. So what I'm doing, and I, this is not my idea, I pinched this idea off an American company who do YouTube and I watched their video on how to do this and their idea is not to shim in there but to shim out here. So put shims between the outer bearing case and the diff housing. And to do that, first of all we need to know what the total clearance is. So if we push that whole housing across as far as it'll go and then with a feeler gauge measure that gap basically that is 36 and a half thousandths of an inch and that's just a nice snug fit so the total clearance is 36 and a half thousandths of an inch what I'll have to do is cut some shims I did do a couple earlier and the reason they're split is to allow me to cut the inner side of them so uh, I did these as a trial that one is twenty four thousandths of an inch thick and that one is eleven foul so that one's a bit thin for this side and that one's a bit thin for this side right so today is another day um, I've had a think about it I've had a look for those shim sets um, they are available from America from a company called Mini Mania they make them but they're quite expensive a 10 thou shim is $13 plus delivery um, and I've got something like 38 thousandths of an inch of total clearance to make up so I'm going to have to cut my own I don't like these that I did before so I'm going to try another one and what I have done is push that bearing as far over as I can so that we've got no backlash and then with the feeler gauges, remeasured that gap uh, in the bearing housing. And there, it's a little bit fiddly, but I make it a comfortable ten thousandths of an inch. So ten thousandths there, with no backlash, and we want four thousandths in four thousandths of an inch of backlash at the edge of the teeth so that needs to come over so we need a shim that's a little bit thinner than ten thou so I'm going to try an eight thou so I've got a piece of eight thou shim stock I doubt if you can see it but I've I've scribed two circles on there one is slightly less than the outside diameter of the outside of the bearing and the other is slightly more than the inside diameter of the outer of the bearing so I'll cut that out and we'll try it in and then see what backlash we've got so this will take a few minutes good pair of aircraft quality tin snips this is just the job for this That's the outer circle cut. Now I need to do the inner circle. Right, so what I've done is I've bored a largish hole using 
a tapered drill bit, but for safety I clamped the shim to a sacrificial piece of plywood, put it in the vise, and then I wasn't having to hold the shim because if the drill snagged and spun it round that would be like a razor blade just sliced through my fingers. Now we can see if I can get the snips in to go around the inside of the circle. There we go. One eighth hour ring shim. Right, let's see if we can get that in. That's it, that's slotted in. Right, now if we push that across, we have a little bit of backlash. Right, I don't know if you can see that uh, dial gauge properly. I finally got it into a position where I can get a reading. And I'm getting 0.1 of a millimetre, which is close, it's as close as makes no odds. So I'm going to go with an eighth of shim there, and then I'll check the clearance on the other side, and shim it to give the tooth a pinch. So, there we go. I'm getting 24 in, 25 in. We're realistically looking for 26, 27 though, because we want tooth of pinch. 25 is just going in. So even though that says it's 20 thou, it measures as 15, and that measures at 12. So a 15 and a 12 makes 27. So that's what we'll go with. Right, so that's my two shims cut. What I do want to do is just reduce the burrs around the edges. So all I'm going to do is just using a side of a lump hammer for a hard surface and a brass face hammer, a little brass face tapping stick, just go around it gently, just to try and flatten out those burrs. Right, now we can turn our attention to this side and see if we can get these two shims in, in a nice orderly fashion. It's a toss up as to which is the easiest way to do this. Put the differential in the housing and then try to get the shims in, or put the housing, put the differential in with the shims all in one go. Let's try and let gravity do a bit of the work. Again, being very careful because these <laughs> there are some razor sharp edges on this. Might be easier to get one in first and then try and get the other one in. I think we're going to have to try plan B, which is putting the whole thing, the diff and the bearings and shims in all in one go. See how that works. Try just gently easing those in with a rubber mallet. That sounds good. second shim on this side hasn't gone down very well. Oh, that's going in nicely. Yes. That's fitted down nicely. See if it'll work this side.
So all I've done is just put a flat screwdriver against the inside edge of the shims and topped it down gently with the little brass hammer. <coughs> There's another point worth mentioning if and when you strip one of these down make sure that you mark the cap for which side of the housing it comes from so I've got a centre pop mark there and one there and on this side I've got two centre pops and two so I know which cap came from which side of the housing it's quite important because they're line board together and then split so if you get them swapped over it'll bind up they won't close down and clamp properly and you'll be in a world of pain tip that on its side and see how that shim's going in not bad that's a bit of guidance that's better Oh, lovely. Right. Pop those on. I'm only putting them on loose at the moment because I haven't got a torque wrench with me to tighten them down. I'll have to double check in the book. Um, the crown wheel the diff bolts are 60 foot pounds and I think the caps are 65 but I might have that the other way around so I'll double check before I torque these down these are already done because I wouldn't have put it together without torquing them down first um, especially since it's such a fiddle getting those shims in that feels pretty good right let's just get this side in Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. <coughs> and in case you're wondering, the purpose of the backlash is to allow for expansion and contraction as these things heat up with friction. Uh, if there was no backlash, when that starts moving and generating heat it would bind up and it would wear very quickly and very soon you'd have a very noisy differential final drive bear in mind that the pinion and crown wheel are the final drive they are not the differential they are the final drive that piece is the differential the bit that allows the two shafts to rotate at different speeds when you're cornering right that's as far as I can go with that one for today. Um, I'm dead chuffed to have got that to there. That does look a bit excessive. I will double check that. Hopefully it's about right. It does look excessive, but then it's difficult to really judge for so. Um, I'll double check it before it all gets finally tightened up and if need be, re-shim to get it correct. Well, basically, that's it. That's how to do pinion preload and set up backlash on a differential of this type for BMC motors. Um, these differentials were fitted in Austin Healy Sprites, MG Midgets, Austin A30s, Austin A30, 35s, Austin A40s, the Farina version, not the earlier version. Um, while there are a few subtle differences between some of the models, they're all basically the same setup. Anyway, that's it for now. Enough of my waffle. I'll let you go and do something more interesting, like picking your toenails, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.